Welcome back to another episode of Spilling the Tea with Dr. T. And G. And Lava Lee. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. We're so glad to have you again on episode seven. Wow, magic number for us. A magic number. We were big Harry Potter fans. If you know, there's seven books of Harry Potter. Seven Horcruxes. And that is Tom Riddle's favorite number. <laughs> it's the magical number. That's it's what the, the author number. says. So Yeah, seven it is. So let's seven see if this a... is a magical episode. <laughs> it's definitely a good a, topic. Yeah, a topic I talk about a lot. Um, I've been working in the men's health space now for almost nine years, over eight oh. years, and definitely one of the most commonly requested questions and um, concerns that patients yeah. come to me for. And from all different ages, right? You have patients there in their 20s, you have patients in their 80s, so you yeah. have a lot of knowledge. Yeah, and a different scope of patients too. Some patients have no past medical history, no medical problems. Some patients have tons and everywhere in between. And so... Yeah. I'm definitely excited to be talking about this. And, and, and I'm see. excited to learn. There's, yeah. I'm sure there's a lot to learn here. And obviously, it's a great question because even uh, people that are young, they have this uh, question, this doubt, like, what's right. going on? What's happening? So let's dive in. Right. And I think doubt is a great way to sort of describe it. I think people feel confused by this whole process when it's happening to them. So yeah, let's dive in. We're going to be discussing why do I not get as hard as I used to? Or mm. why are my erections more weak now than they were before? Or why is it more difficult for me to get an erection? Um, and there's a wide range of reasons for that. But most importantly, I think why this topic is so important to discuss is how I think a lot of men do have a lot of confusion around the topic. It happens more commonly than they think, and it's not widely talked about. We typically think erectile dysfunction or erectile issues happen when we're much older or due to sorts of medical problems and concerns and conditions. Um, but that's just not really the case. It can happen to anyone. It can be temporary. It can worsen. It can be consistent. Um, but really trying to address this because, again, it can impact people's physical health, their their mental, mental. health. You know, our sexual health, it really goes um, beyond just our, our sexuality. And so hopefully we'll be able to answer some questions and concerns of yours. If you have other concerns or things pop into your head throughout this episode, please comment below. Let us know. We'd love to answer those or um, answer them in a follow-up video. So, so let's dive in. Yeah. What, what you got for me? So first, let's start with the basics. Can you explain to us how does the erection happen? Yeah, so erections are quite complicated. They uh, typically are a result of multiple factors all working together to create the phenomenon. And so you're going to have a vascular component, a hormonal component, and a nerve component. So vascular, the most important part, is getting enough blood to the genitalia to create an erection. And of course, that blood engorges the organ or basically makes it swell so that it is able to become firm enough to penetrate. So that's what we need for an erection. So there's the blood vessel part, and then there's the hormonal part. So for men, we have testosterone. Testosterone primes the brain to prepare us for sexual function and arousal, intimacy, and it also keeps the sexual organ healthy. So that testosterone is constantly ensuring all those blood vessels are healthy. The organ is repairing itself as needed. And so that's a big major part. And then finally, the nerve part. So there's a connection between our brain that goes through nerve signals to our genitalia. So our brain has to basically say, hey, it's time to get ready to go. Let's let's get into action mode. So all these things need to be functioning normally in order to create an erection. So as you can imagine, because there's so many moving pieces and moving parts, if anything along the way, or if any of those parts are damaged or dysfunctional, there's gonna be a problem um, with the end result. So that can lead to either a difficulty to achieve an erection, a difficulty to maintain the erection, or you just notice your erections are weaker than usual. And that's usually because something along that pathway is not working like it should. And all those things are working at the same time. Yeah. Wow. It's all happening. The body is chaotic and very organized all yeah. at the same time. Fascinating. Fascinating. So can you explain to us why those blood vessels are so important? Absolutely. So there's a lot to cover with blood vessels. So bear with me here. Um, initially, of course, when you are preparing for intimacy, you're going to have chemical signals that come from your brain that tell your organs to start preparing. And the number one way in how they prepare is allowing for blood flow to start getting shunted into the genitalia. So what happens is 
the blood vessels that are bringing blood to the genitalia are going to open up, allowing more blood to move in. That allows the organ to swell. And so blood moves into the spongy tissue around the, the penis and is gonna help to create firmness. And so we need those blood vessels to be nice and healthy so that they're able to move blood in quickly. How it works too is the blood vessels are aligned with something called smooth muscle cells. So these are types of cells that are gonna respond to your brain saying, hey, let's get ready to go. Those muscle cells will relax. And so as they relax, just think of a muscle relaxing around a blood vessel, it's gonna allow more blood to move in. And so all those little moving pieces are important, but what we also need to know is blood vessels are important to bring blood in, but they're also really important to keep the blood there. So when we have blood moving out of an organ, that's using veins, which are also blood vessels. They're just built a little bit differently. They're a lot weaker in the sense that the walls of them are a lot easier to compress. And this is a good thing in regards to an erection. So we need those blood veins to compress so that they don't allow blood to leave. Wow. The penis. So imagine you have blood moving in through a faucet into the organ. The organ starts to swell, and as it's swelling and becoming engorged, it's actually cutting off the veins. So the veins are getting compressed. Those veins typically will take blood away, but because they're compressed and not open like they typically are, blood is moving out a lot slower. That's why an erection forms, because typically blood goes into an organ and out of an organ at the same rate, right? That's why we don't have swelling in our hands when right. we walk around or swelling in our nose or our feet. That's because the blood vessels are moving things in and the veins out. are taking it out at, a, at the same rate. So when we see an erection occur, it's because the blood vessels are moving the blood into the organ quickly and the veins are taking the blood out very slowly. If that makes wow. sense. Yeah. Is the penis the only organ in the human body that has this process? I mean, it's the only one that comes to mind. Anything that is going to be engorged, so the clitoris right. can have some, obviously, for women. Um, but for men, it's pretty much the only organ that is going to be hoping that your veins become compromised. Wow. Otherwise, you know, uh, we would be swelling everywhere, <laughs> <laughs> which may not be so good. Right. And because proper blood flow is essential, anything that is going to damage or impair that blood flow is going to have consequences on our erection forming. So things like high blood pressure, which over time can damage blood vessels and our veins, things like atherosclerosis or heart disease, development of plaque on arteries makes them much more rigid and hard to expand. So they're not going to dilate very easily. Diabetes, over time that sugar starts to irritate blood vessels and veins. So all these sort of conditions or really any other condition that's going to damage your blood vessels ultimately may lead to symptoms of erectile dysfunction. Wow, that's crazy. Very interesting how all those processes are going on at the same time. Let's not cut it too short because right. we've got more to say. What about the hormones? Uh, how the hormones help us to create an erection? Right. So the male dominant hormone being testosterone is extremely important in the creation of an erection as well. Of course, testosterone is going to impact our blood vessels. It's going to impact that whole process that we just discussed, but it also has more function. So let's get into that. Let's get into that. So there are actually four main functions that testosterone has in regards to helping us achieve and maintain erections. So number one, testosterone is really important with our libido and our sex drive. So basically our arousal state. Number two, it's really important in the creation of something called nitric oxide, which we'll get into shortly. Number three, it's really important in inhibiting an enzyme called phosphodiesterase 5 or PDE5. Phosphodiesterase 5. Yeah, very okay. specific. And number four, it maintains all of the physiological structures and the health of the genitalia as far as the anatomy and the physiology there. So let's break it down. Yeah, let's break it down. So tell me the relationship between testosterone and libido. Right. So testosterone is the major factor in creating our sex drive. So our libido or sex drive, of course, is happening in our brain. It gives us the urge to want intimacy, to want to begin the sexual process. And so testosterone is going to be the major factor there. So patients that typically have a normal or optimal testosterone value are likely going to have a higher sex drive. Similarly, if you don't have a great sex drive or if you notice your libido is low, it's likely your testosterone is poor or deficient. So something to consider, certainly if that is a part of why you're concerned about your erection strength or your libido, definitely get screened for low testosterone. But basically it's kind of the primal start of the whole process and we need that in order to really get ourselves going. So tell me about the nitric oxide and how testosterone is so important there. 
So nitric oxide is a powerful vasodilator that's released by cells in our body. So the whole mechanism in which blood flow is moving through those blood vessels into our genitalia, the main factors there include both nitric oxide and something called cyclic GMP, which we'll get into shortly. But nitric oxide is released by smooth muscle cells next to those blood vessels and says, hey, blood vessel, time to open up, time to dilate, allowing that blood to move through. Testosterone is the key metabolite responsible for ensuring all those smooth muscle cells are able to properly make nitric oxide. So it's wow. important there to make sure, of course, that all these functions are taking place. So not only is testosterone important with our libido, but it's actually getting into the molecular level and making sure that our nitric oxide is also uh, created normally. All right, you're gonna have to help him with this one. Let's go again. Phosphoro? Diesterase. Diesterase. Five. Five. Phospho? Phospho. Di. Di. Esterase. Esterase. Five. Five. Phosphodiesterase sort of five. Yes. Why is it so important? So you can call it PDE5 as well. Much better. So phosphodiesterase five or PDE5 is an important enzyme that is also present in those smooth muscle cells. But rather than creating nitric oxide, which is what testosterone is going to be doing there or even having anything to do with nitric oxide, its important job is to break down something called cyclic gonosine monophosphate or CGMP for short. So CGMP works very similar to nitric oxide. So nitric oxide again goes to those blood vessels telling them to dilate from the smooth muscle cells which are adjacent or next to them. Those smooth muscle cells are also creating the cyclic GMP. So this cyclic GMP tells the blood vessels to grow and to stay open so more blood is moving through but this enzyme PDE5 goes around cutting it up and telling it to inactivate. This is an important enzyme when we want to stop an erection, right? So when you're done, you've reached climax, this enzyme goes up really high, which is why we lose an erection really quickly after you've finished your sexual escapade. So phosphodiesterase 5 is going to be really important enzyme to help us move on from an erection, but we don't want that enzyme to be super active when we're trying to create an erection. That then is going to make it much more difficult. So testosterone actually inhibits this enzyme. So if our testosterone is elevated, it's going to help prevent that enzyme from acting, thus allowing us to keep an erection longer. And that's why men with higher testosterone values often report having longer erections, stronger erections. And interestingly enough, this phosphodiesterase 5 or PDE5 is actually the area in which the drug Viagra or Cialis work. So they both work to block this enzyme, which then causes an erection. So because that enzyme is blocked, the cyclic GMP is very high, allowing that blood to move into the genitalia and to create a longer lasting erection, which is why having high testosterone sometimes feels like you're taking Viagra, Viagra or Cialis. Wow. Yeah. It's basically, I mean, you're taking a medication that inhibits that right. hormone. Exactly. We talk about blood vessels. We talk about nitric oxide. We talk about that fancy enzyme that I don't know the name anymore. <laughs> what about tissue health and how is testosterone so important? Right. So we have a bunch of different types of cells and tissue in the genital region. And one of testosterone's jobs is to basically go around surveying the area and making sure that all the old cells or things that need to move on and allow new cells to recreate. All those functionings are working. We need it to be recovering down there well, rejuvenating and preparing for the next episode. Right. So testosterone is key there to make sure all of our tissues and our genital health are healthy and uh, repairing themselves in a timely manner. You know, it has to be ready for the next one. Always got to be ready. Testosterone, make sure you're ready. <laughs> so what happens when someone has a testosterone deficiency? Right, so if someone is uh, having a testosterone deficiency or suboptimal level of testosterone, this is going to be uh, facilitated through many different factors in their health. But when we're talking about erections, of course, it's going to reduce their arousal state, reduce their libido, so they're not going to be as interested sexually. Also, it's going to reduce the amount of blood flow that's readily available and able to move into the genitalia. So you're going to see a weaker erection, maybe a more difficult time achieving one or maintaining one. But ultimately, in general, men with lower testosterone are going to have a more difficult time with erections and their sexual um, appetite in general. How are the nerve signals important in creating an erection? Right, so again, another big player in helping us to achieve an erection is going to be those nerve signals that come from our brain down to the genitalia. And so there is a specific system called the autonomic nervous system. Basically, it's happening mm. automatically, as you can imagine with the name. 
And there's a version or a uh, portion of the autonomic nervous system called the parasympathetic nervous system. So there is uh, the responsibility of the parasympathetic nervous system is basically what we call the rest and digest phase. So you're usually in between two areas of the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So parasympathetic, you think is more like I'm chilling, I'm relaxing, there's no stress around me, nothing to worry about. And then the sympathetic is more the fight or flight response. Mm -hmm. And they're always sort of in balance of one another. One is always dominating the other, especially in one particular area of the body. When it comes to creating an erection, the parasympathetic, the rest and digest, the calm, relaxing, let's have some fun side of things is what's in charge. And so those nerves are going to be sending signals down to the genitalia saying, hey, we have no fears, there's no stress. Now you can create an erection so we can enjoy ourselves. The specific chemical that is released in these nerves is called acetylcholine. It's probably the most commonly used um, sort of metabolite of a signal in the body to give nerves um, basically information. And so acetylcholine will go through the nerve down all the way to the blood vessels again next to the genitalia tell those blood vessels by releasing acetylcholine into the smooth muscle cell, hey, it's time to wake up and relax so we can create an erection. Wow. Those smooth muscle cells then say, hey, there's a bunch of acetylcholine here, let's make nitric oxide. Nitric oxide will increase, allowing for those vessels to relax, and so blood is able to move to the genitalia and thus create a firm erection. That's why you need to be relaxed whenever you're going to have intercourse like right well yeah it, so technically the when you think about it that's why you shouldn't be stressed ah, and that's yeah. why stress can be such a problem for people when it comes to creating an erection and why one of the most common causes for erectile right. dysfunction especially for young people is stress or yeah. anxiety because if you're stressed or anxious your parasympathetic right. system is off and your sympathetic system is on uh, that makes sense that explains why you have to be in a good mental yeah. state of, you know, right, ready to do so. You need to be ready to do so. But what happens if the system is damaged? Right, so anything that can damage our nervous system um, or impair it in any type of way is gonna have consequences down the line, right? So things like uh, multiple sclerosis, which is a nerve problem that happens in the brain, things like diabetes that affects our peripheral nerves, so our nerves you know, deep throughout the body, those nerve endings can get irritated from diabetes. If you've had a stroke or anything that really damages any part of your nervous system, there can be consequences in which your body's not able to properly deliver that acetylcholine to tell those smooth muscle cells, hey, let's wake up, let's create an erection. And so anything along uh, the nervous system that's damaged is gonna subsequently result in a weaker or inability to have a normal erection. So we learn about blood vessels, hormones, and nerves, but are there any changes that happen to our erections as we get older? Yeah, so the majority of us that experience problems with our erections, they do typically happen to older men because of the confounding factors that can occur as we age. So certainly our sex drive is usually lower as we get older. Our blood vessels are not as flexible or responsive to stimuli as we get older. We typically also have weakening in our nerves because the majority of American men have chronic diseases like diabetes, high blood pressure, or some sort of cardiovascular disease. And so yeah, so all those things we do typically see as we age because those confounding factors start to really aggravate the ability to create an erection as we age. So it's normal as we age, we start seeing a difference in our erections. You know, that's an interesting word, normal, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's common. I don't know if it's normal. I, normal to me is maybe different than normal to someone right. else, right? For me, right. that would not feel normal. I would want to try to improve whether that included lifestyle changes, taking medication, whatever, because I personally want to have the best direction every time. But that's my normal. That's what I want my normal to be. It, do I have to do things to make that happen? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so I think normal or expected, you could say, I guess, you could interchange those mm -hmm. words and say we are expected to see that happen as we age, but I don't think we should let that take over our sex lives. Otherwise, we're going to not be very happy. And that's why maybe some people aren't very happy with their sex lives as they yeah. let those factors sort of take over. Everyone deserves a good erection. Absolutely. Erections for all. <laughs> Put in the water. Put it in the water. <laughs> <laughs> so how does age impact our sexual function? So certainly there's going to be an increase in risk of chronic disease. Again, our body is, is not as flexible, including our blood vessels, nerves. 
But what we do for sure know is as we get older, our testosterone value starts to plummet. And as that testosterone value is lower, we see that role of how important testosterone is in our libido, our sex drive, also maintaining the health of our genitalia, keeping all of those organs highly vascular, letting those nerves be sharp and responsive to stimuli, we know that that's all related. So we do think that it's likely related to the fact that our testosterone values are decreasing as we age, which then makes our sexual function also decrease and deteriorate with those testosterone values. So are there any lifestyle choices or habits that can impact our erections? Absolutely. So the main three are going to be what we eat, so our diet, our exercise routine, and our sleep. So starting with diet, of course, the average American diet, including the way that I ate just over a couple years ago, I would consider very poor. And of course, when we're younger, our diet is not going to have much of an impact on our erections. But what we do need to take into account and understand is even when we're younger, eating processed food that has a lot of sugar right. and a lot of fat is already damaging our blood vessels. It's already causing damage to the nerves in our body. We don't see those results right now because we're young. That accumulates. And our body can help, can handle it. But yes, it, it accumulates. And so actually there's clinical evidence to show that the average American 12-year-old male already has plaque developing in his heart. Oh my so God. So that's just because of the average diet that we eat. So being conscious of that, understanding that we do need to take action as early as possible. Certainly, if you have symptoms of erectile dysfunction, it's not too late. Your diet can still make a major impact. And so trying to add more unprocessed foods, so lots of fruits and vegetables, um, a lot of fiber can also be helpful for overall heart health. But we do know fruit and vegetables also are really helpful in your body's ability to make nitric oxide. So adding a bunch of those into your diet, specifically beets. You may even see there's like beet supplements where people try to improve their heart health. It, right. they, they say in some of them we can, it can reduce your blood pressure and this and that. That's not necessarily what I'm trying to get across here. I don't think buying beet supplements is your <laughs> next best step. I think putting some beets in your salad, cutting That's a them. a better idea. I don't think you should have beet juice. Beet juice is full of sugar. Please avoid yeah. juicing or juices. In, in my opinion, way. it's just a ton of sugar. Yeah. So, and again, if you love juicing, I do apologize. Don't Please don't come for me. But eat, eat the beets. Eat the beets. Eat the sugar, whatever you want. But I personally think beets have a lot of fiber. If you cut them up, put them in your diet, you don't need to buy a supplement or juice it. Um, you're, you're losing out on a ton of healthy fiber there. But yeah, so diet is huge, extremely important, and can make a major difference whether you're starting early or after symptoms have already presented. And when it comes to exercise, of course, this is fundamental. It's extremely important to help move blood throughout the body at a fast pace. It helps your blood vessels maintain their health. It helps them respond to stress and to changes in your blood pressure really well too. We do know that over time, especially if you have high blood pressure, Blood vessels can get very rigid and very damaged from that pressure over uh, you know, years and years. And so they become less flexible. They don't want to dilate to help you create an erection. So exercise is key. And even if you already have chronic disease, even if you already have symptoms of erectile dysfunction, exercise has been proven to improve your symptoms. So wow. something to definitely add into your routine. Of course, if you have a medical history that's complicated, talk to your doctor, make sure they okay your ability to exercise. And then finally, sleep. Sleep is so important. Oh, yeah. So sleep not only is one of the most important factors in ensuring that you're able to create testosterone optimally, it's also the most important factor to help your body and tissues in every part of your organs regenerate, recover, repair. And so making sure you get at least seven to eight hours of sleep nightly is going to be uh, really important to your overall health as well as ensuring your erections are at the top of their game. Well, we have a wonderful video that if you haven't watched yet, please do. <laughs> we talked about the relationship sleep. of least sleep and testosterone. Yeah. So check it out. Check it out it's if a, you haven't yet. This is our intra video video promotion. This is the universe. <laughs> we're creating. Welcome to the universe. Uh, we're creating a uh, Hendrix Health universe. The T universe. The universe. The Lava Lee universe. The lava. It's all about Lava Lee. <laughs> it's all about Lava Lee. Are there certain medical conditions that have an increased risk for causing problems with erections? Absolutely. So chronic medical diseases or conditions like diabetes, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease or atherosclerosis, which is the development of plaque along blood vessels, are all going to be major players and causes for patients to develop in erectile dysfunction. Again, these are going to hit 
common important functions needed to create an erection so the blood vessels are going to be damaged it's going to damage your nerves it can also have an impairment effect on your testosterone value so anything that's going to impact any of those areas in regards to medical conditions can consequently mm -hmm. result in erectile dysfunction that being said not every person with diabetes high blood pressure heart disease or any of those conditions will is, have. right automatically is not going to necessarily have erectile dysfunction they're just at an increased risk and if those conditions are all well managed if you're on medication and you're you know working towards improving the symptoms associated um, you certainly can avoid developing erectile dysfunction they're not a direct correlation there and certainly many patients have erectile dysfunction that have none of those medical conditions so again they're not it's not a cause and effect thing there's just a tight correlation what about medications? Are there any medication that can cause problems with erections? Absolutely. So this is a huge one and likely one of the main causes for healthy individuals to experience erectile dysfunction symptoms. So we see patients typically on blood pressure medicine, typically on medication to treat anxiety and depression. Those are like the major three classes of medications that are ultimately going to result in symptoms of erectile dysfunction. And that's not every medication in that class. So if you are on blood pressure medicine or on medicine to treat your anxiety or depression and you have symptoms of erectile dysfunction, it's really important that you tell your doctor because there are other medications they can switch you to so these are not like a the only thing you can take uh, and it's going to cause and that does happen from time to time there are certain blood pressure medicines that doctors are like i'm so sorry this is the only one for you or anxiety or depression medicines that's not the majority of patients though so if you have these symptoms tell your doctor so that they can at least try to work with you to find an alternative that may work better and prevent you from having that as a side effect so you talk about how stress and anxiety can cause erectile dysfunction is this common? There's a huge relationship between anxiety and stress and the development of symptoms of erectile dysfunction. We kind of talked about this earlier with the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic side being dominant oftentimes for patients that are stressed or anxious. And of course, that's going to shut down those parasympathetic signals telling the body it's time to create an erection. So we do know that a lot of young people, especially that are experiencing symptoms of erectile dysfunction are often experiencing it due to stress right. and anxiety. And so certainly there is a huge correlation there. I often tell patients to consider talking to their doctor. Medication to treat anxiety can be extremely helpful in helping patients to have better erections. Wow. Some of those medicines can actually cause uh, erectile dysfunction wow. themselves. So it's kind of complicated. Right. But that's another reason to present to your doctor, not just saying, hey, I have anxiety. Say, hey, I have anxiety and, and erectile dysfunction. Can we find an option that's going to treat both? And so, you know, of course, letting your doctor know as much information as possible is always going to be necessary. Uh, but yeah, there is a tight correlation there. And a lot of patients, especially younger, don't understand because usually you would think these things would be happening to older people or right. people with a lot of medical conditions or, or medical concerns. But just stress itself can be a heavy factor in causing erectile dysfunction. But it's interesting too, because anxiety could be happening because of erectile dysfunction and erectile dysfunction could be happening because of anxiety. So those things are all related to each other. Yeah, and just like many other medical conditions, this is, becomes a cycle, right? Like what came first? Did my right. erections weakening cause my anxiety, which is now triggering my erections to be weaker? And this is also a great um, lead way into the next idea of something called performance anxiety. So there is anxiety, generalized anxiety disorder, of course, where you feel anxiety throughout the day, sometimes different times of the day, but in general, overall, you feel anxious. And then there's something called performance anxiety where you only feel anxious before having wow. sex. And so the treatment for both of these different conditions, whether they're a similar physiological response when you have anxiety, you kind of feel the same, the treatment options are extremely different. So you don't want to confuse the two and you want to explain them properly to your doctor. An example, someone with generalized anxiety disorder needs to be on a medication to manage that on a daily basis. If you have performance anxiety, you need to consider initially ways to manage that stress and coping mechanisms. Of course, we don't want to jump to medication, but when it is appropriate, they're going to be treated with erectile dysfunction medicine because once they get more confident in achieving and maintaining an erection and realize they don't need to be anxious about their performance, those anxiety symptoms start to go away and then they no longer need the ED medication unless they want to continue it for whatever reason. But you wouldn't give someone ED medication for generalized anxiety right. disorder because that's not really the main issue there. They never were anxious about achieving an erection. It's more so their anxiety in general is now causing it a problem for them to achieve or maintain an erection.
So you give Viagra to someone who is suffering from performance anxiety. Yeah. So there is erectile dysfunction due to performance anxiety or performance anxiety mm -hmm. induced erectile dysfunction. And so those patients clinically are approved for erectile dysfunction medication wow. like sildenafil uh, and Cialis as, as long as they're, of course, um, you know, medically appropriate. So for those out there who are concerned about their erections being weaker than they used to be, what can they do to improve their erections? Right. So there are many different lifestyle factors, which we've already discussed, that can play a heavy role in improving symptoms of weak erections. Of course, number one you want to think of is how much stress is in your life and how much can you do to sort of navigate around that stress or avoid it. Things also you want to be considered about is are you experiencing symptoms of anxiety or depression? If so, these can certainly be causing weaker erections or erectile dysfunction. So you want to talk to your doctor about those symptoms. If you have a chronic disease like high blood pressure or diabetes or maybe high cholesterol and you're on medication to treat these concerns, but you're noticing weaker erections are happening now or they're not as strong as they used to be, this could be a sign that your chronic disease is worsening or not well managed. So you want to talk to your doctor, maybe your blood pressure is out of control or your blood sugar is going higher than they're aware of, maybe change some medication around. So certainly, again, a reason to talk to your doctor about your chronic medical condition and make sure that that's not causing any of these new or worsening symptoms. And then, of course, you want to consider exercise. Are you exercising often? If not, 30 minutes of cardiovascular activity is a great way to add a new exercise routine into your schedule. So trying to carve out that half an hour to be on a treadmill, walking, or even outside um, exercise has been, of course, proven to help reduce stress. So just like we talked about previously, also exercise can help manage chronic medical conditions like diabetes and high blood pressure better. And then of course, exercise is going to move blood all throughout the body and make it more easy for your body to respond to those blood pressure changes. Of course, blood flow is extremely important in creating an erection. So exercise is going to be really beneficial there too. Finally, the last thing to be aware of in regards to lifestyle modification is where it all begins and ends, right. and that's, of course, the kitchen. So what are you eating? What does your diet look like? Is it high in unprocessed food? Is it high in fruits and vegetables that are going to be helpful in creating nitric oxide, that powerful vasodilator that you need to create a strong erection? Or is it high in processed foods, fatty foods, fried foods, things that it would be um, ideal for you to start pushing out of your diet so you can maintain your health and maintain stronger, more satisfying erections? There are a lot of different players in the... Yeah. In it's the multifactorial. It's multifactorial. <laughs> it, could be, it could be anything. It could be one thing. It could be multiple things. Yeah. If you fix one thing, that could lead you to have uh, better erections. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. It's worth trying. So when should someone consider medication to treat poor erections? Yeah, this is a great question because it's going to be different for everybody depending on their own personal preferences, how severe their weakened erections are and how much they're impacting their life. So initially, I typically recommend most patients try lifestyle modification, right? So work on the diet, work on the exercise, make sure your chronic medical conditions are well maintained, uh, make sure you're you know, addressing any stressors, anxiety, depression in your life. Uh, after you've checked all those boxes, or maybe you've decided that those aren't possible for you or your symptoms are so severe they're impacting your relationship, talk to a doctor. It's relatively simple to find access in in today's world with you know telemedicine and remote physician accessibility especially to treat something as simple as erectile dysfunction there's so many places out there where you can go and talk to a doctor relatively quickly tell them your symptoms determine if medication is appropriate in general ed medications come with very few side effects for the majority of healthy people of course there's things to be aware of and your doctor will talk to you about that but most patients tolerate them really well i've treated patients age 18 to 100 wow. you know and all of them have varying medical history some have complex medical issues some have none some are experiencing ED symptoms because of anxiety, depression, performance anxiety. Some are experiencing it due to chronic diabetes. So everywhere and in between, you know, everyone can be applicable to try medication to see if it helps them. You just need to talk to a doctor and make sure that you discuss those risks versus benefits. Talk to your doctor. All right, now, drum roll please, it's time for us to go into the myths and misconceptions. This is certainly one of my favorite parts because some of them are crazy, interesting. interesting. Some of them I actually thought myself before yeah, me too. becoming a doctor. So, you know, these are realistic and and hopefully we'll maybe answer some questions people have out there. So myth number one, and this is obviously 
probably the most popular one, is erectile dysfunction happening only with older men? Yeah, again, a very common myth, definitely a question that I get from younger patients all the time. Is this supposed to only happen in older men? And the answer is no, it happens to pretty much everyone. Everyone, you know, any age group between 18 to 100, this can happen to you. It can be temporary, it can be episodic, so it happens occasionally or it can be lifelong. And so um, it's important that if you're having symptoms of a weaker erection or severe symptoms that you talk to a doctor so you can find out what's going to be most appropriate to get yourself feeling better regardless of how old you are. Is it true that erectile dysfunction is solely a physical issue? Yeah, so this is another question we get. Is erectile dysfunction only caused by physical changes like damage to the vasculature, the blood vessels near the genitalia, or the nerves, or the hormones? And not necessarily. Many patients have symptoms of erectile dysfunction due to psychological or mental changes, concerns like anxiety, depression, stress. So it's definitely not only a physical problem and not something we only see with people that have chronic you know, physical conditions. It could be something completely different. Is it true if a man cannot get hard as before is a sign of irreversible damage? So this is not true, of course. Many uh, aspects of the cause for erectile dysfunction or symptoms of a weaker erection are reversible. And it's just about talking to a doctor to find what is causing your symptoms. Uh, some patients will choose to take medication for those symptoms relatively quickly. Some will uh, be able to come off those medications. So again, no, it's not irreversible. There's definitely options and abilities to improve your symptoms. Is it true that masturbation or sexual activities can cause erectile dysfunction? So this is not true. Regular sexual activity or masturbation have been proven to be very healthy and can actually help to promote overall uh, optimal sexual health. There's no clinical study to show that erectile dysfunction can come from masturbation. Masturbation is extremely healthy. It also helps to promote um, superior mental health and reduce stress and anxiety. So I highly recommend masturbating out there can't do it too much. And uh, yeah, so absolutely not. Nothing to be worried about here. You're good to go. You're good to go. <laughs> Doctor's orders. Doctor's orders. Every day at least. <laughs> Put it in the water. Put it in the water. Is it true that all cases of erectile dysfunction require medication like Viagra? Yeah, so this is not true. So again, as we talked about previously, you can consider trying lifestyle modification factors, you know, increasing your exercise, watching your diet, making sure your chronic medical conditions are managed. Uh, but certainly medications can be applicable. And it doesn't mean if you start a medication that you have to stay on it forever. Some patients just need a little nudge to get through uh, a time or a situation when they're experiencing these symptoms. Um, and again, those medications are usually really well tolerated. So not everyone needs them, but they're certainly available to pretty much everyone. Is it true that having occasional difficulty maintaining or achieving an erection, a man has erectile dysfunction? So no, so occasional difficulties achieving an erection or maintaining one, or if you have weak erections, some of the time that is considered normal. So certainly don't worry or stress if you think an occasional time where you're not able to perform as, as well as previously is a problem. It's more of a problem if it starts to impact your sexual function, your mental health, your you know confidence, your relationship. Um, so if it becomes more of a pattern or if it becomes more often, certainly talk to a doctor as there may be something larger going on. But occasional weak erections is completely normal. It's completely normal. Well, hopefully this was an educational experience for you all. Was it an educational experience for you? Yeah, I've learned a lot <laughs> with this episode and the other one. Now I know how to make bigger loads oh. and have firmer erections. So I feel like I am ready to... I did not see that coming, <laughs> literally. But yeah, you know, these are supposed to, you know, all add together and be a well-rounded educational experience. Yeah. Um, if you have any comments, questions, concerns, please leave them in the comments below. We will take a look and get back to you. Maybe, you know, create a video to respond to some of your questions in the future. Um, like, yeah. share, subscribe, carrier pigeon, drop yeah. a pin, leave a poem. Anything. I mean, anything. All just watch and just listen and apply. Take this information and apply to your life. I think we already accomplished our goal here. Absolutely. Which is to educate you <laughs> and, you know, make it a fun experience, hopefully. Yeah. yeah. I hope. I hope and so. And educational, right? Yes. This is education. This is PBS. This is YouTube. So you talk about how anxiety and stress can cause erectile. Erectile. <laughs> Erectile 
Dust Function. <laughs> <laughs>